Good evening. On behalf of the Planning Committee, I would like to welcome all of you to the uh, opening part of this uh, very fascinating uh, symposium conference uh, on the contributions of Eduardo Mondlan and uh, the ongoing work in Mozambique. It's a particular pleasure to welcome you to the First Church in Oberlin as the locale of this first part of the presentation. It's familiar territory for me. And uh, also uh, a building which is rich in uh, African and Afro-American heritage. And it's perhaps particularly fitting that the keynote address should be in this space. I noticed when I came to campus that last Saturday there was a gathering here on uh, John Mercer Langston and Oberlin's antebellum, antebellum African American heritage. And uh, uh, Frederick Douglass has uh, spoken in this space and many other people through the decades. Uh, and it's, uh, it's a wonderful occasion to have this evening a presentation from Mozambique uh, drawing uh, ties to Eduardo Mondlan of the class of 1953 of Oberlin College. Uh, presenting our speaker this evening will be uh, Dr. Ben Wisner, who taught at Eduardo Mondlan University. He teaches now at Caltech, but he said it would be con too confusing to try to explain the connection there to here. But the Eduardo Mondlan University connection is clear, and I'm delighted that you're able to be here. Thank you very much. I have a great, great pleasure uh, to introduce our distinguished visitor from Mozambique, uh, Dr. Leonardo Santos uh, Simao, the Minister of Foreign Affairs and Cooperation of the Republic of Mozambique. He is a person who combines so well the two sides or qualities of an excellent foreign minister. The first is a deep understanding of the needs of his compatriots. As a medical doctor with many years of practice at district and provincial level as well as in the capital, Dr. Simao brings to his work as foreign minister such humanitarian understanding he served as district health director in Shai Shai, as provincial health director in Zambezia, and minister of health. During this medical practice, he worked as surgeon, as hospital director, and educator. The other quality he brings to his post as foreign minister is wide travel abroad that affords him understanding of how the needs and resources, as well as talents, of the Mozambican people fit into the new mosaic of opportunities and dangers created by globalization. He has studied in London, where he earned a Master's of Public Health at London University, and also in Boston, earning a certificate in health economics from Boston University. Dr. Simao speaks six languages and has been honored by the governments of Brazil, Portugal, and South Africa. Dr. Simao's broad knowledge of human development issues is further evidenced by his membership in the World Bank's Panel on Health Policies in Africa and Mozambique's National Mine Clearing Commission. Dr. Simao has also taught at Universidad Eduardo Mondelan, teaching medicine at that university, and serves as an elected deputy in the National Assembly, as well as on Frilimo's Central Committee. I suspect that if more foreign ministers in the world today were medical doctors and educators, the world would be a much more peaceful, and compassionate place. It is with great, great pleasure that I give you Dr. Leonardo Santos Simao.
Thank you very much indeed. This is Nancy Dai, President of Oberlin College, members of the faculty, members of the student associations, ladies and gentlemen. At the outset, allow me to express my deep gratitude and honor to the co-sponsors for having invited me to this college today to pay a special tribute to Eduardo Mondlane, founder and first president of, Mozambi of the Mozambique Liberation Front, and the men all Mozambicans and I most admire. I feel very much indebted to Professor Emeritus Ol McQueen, uh, McQueen and his team for their leadership in organizing this unparalleled initiative, which will enable all us to review the accomplishment and reflect on the legacies of Eduardo Mondlane as a world citizen and as a man who spearheaded the liberation struggle of his people. I therefore regard this occasion as a landmark event to honor the man who, by virtue of his wisdom, and statesmanship played a vital role for the independence of Mozambique and indeed the Southern African Af uh, region as a whole. I wish to acknowledge with the gratitude the presence among us today of uh, Mr. Jeanette Mondlane and the children whose contribution for the just cause of Mozambique deserve our full recognition. Many of our accomplishments during and following the ultimate death of Dr. Edward Mundlane are linked to her wisdom and determination. Once again, we wish to thank her for that. Undoubtedly, we all regret the fact that Edward Mundlane is no longer with us. His legacy, however, will always guide present and future generation of generations of Mozambicans in the search for solutions to problems facing our country and the world at large. We are proud to learn that Eduardo Mulan is not only a hero for Mozambique, but also a role model for other peoples around the world. From the outset, Eduardo Mulan realized that the value of the Mozambican citizen rested on his freedom and on his right to, to, to determine his own destiny, history, and cultural identity. Thirty years ago, he wrote that one of the major lessons to be learned from the struggle in Mozambique was that freedom should not be construed as a mere expulsion of Portuguese colonial authorities, but equal to promote the reconstruction of a new country through a solid national development. He therefore strived for a better future for all Mozambicans. As I stand here before you as a representative of New Mozambique, I cannot do so without mentioning the role played by Eduardo Mundlane in bringing us to where we are today. His assassination in 1969 came at the most critical moment for the struggle for independence. The perpetrators of this heinous crime had expected to withhold and roll back the course of history and thereby negating the attainment of freedom in our country. They were wrong. They had never conceived that Mundlane had prepared his people for the worst and for the best. His lessons enable us to withstand a ferocious enemy and translate Mundan's dream into a reality to which we all be eternal in debt. Today, we are here to say thank you, Oberlin College. Thank you, all of you, for your support. Mundan was may rest in peace because his efforts have indeed been vindicated. Mundan may rest in peace because they made it possible to bring about a peaceful country heading to prosperity 
in spite of so many challenges we have endured in our history, including two, three generations of armed conflicts, which lasted for about 30 years. Most of Mozambicans, 23 years of independence, retain vivid memories of these special circumstances. It was in recognition the high interest of our people that my government decided to undertake a difficult process of transformation, including negotiations, which culminated with the signing of the General Peace Accor Agreement for Mozambique in 1992. The Rome Agreement brought about an end to the suffering of our people and represented the beginning of a new era for all Mozambicans, a new era in which peace, stability, and national reconciliation constitute, constitute our main priorities. One of the most important lessons inherited from Dr. Mundan is to understand and accept our differences, cultures, and history in order to promote unity and diversity as the best way to preserve our Mozambican identity. Since then, we have passed through a number of transitions ranging from one party to multi-party political system, from centralized economy to market-oriented economy, from war to peace, and from emergence aid to rehabilitation of our country. Today, we are laying down the foundation for our future development. Thus, we have succeeded in creating an enabling environment for consolidation of democracy and promoting development, in concentrating on economic fundamentals, including low inflation rates, stable, stable democracy, currency, a transparent exchange policy, a stimulation of private sector growth, and increment in foreign and domestic investment, the Mozambican economy is achieving the desired results. Last year, we recorded a 12% GDP growth compared to a real average growth of around 6.6% from 1991 to 1996. We have privatized over 900 state-owned companies and rehabilitated or restructured major infrastructures such as roads, ports, and railways. These positive res results enable us to attract more investment to the country. We are now involved in the implementation of big projects such as the Mapu Development Corridor, which is a joint initiative by the governments of Mozambique and South Africa. The $1.3 billion Mosal aluminum smelter, recently announced by the London Metal Exchange and the Lebombo Special Development Initiative, involved in Mozambique, Swaziland, and South Africa. Within the framework of the Southern African Development Community, known as SADC, we are gradually changing the shape of our region, which for so many years had been characterized by conflict into one of prosperity and economic integration. We have embarked on a process that is aimed at contributing to the challenge of globalized economies. The leaders of SADC are conscious that in today's world, interdependence is no longer a matter of choice, rather an issue affecting the very existence of nations, and that the faster we are, the better we shall succeed in preventing our countries from being marginalized in the international marketplace. We try to avoid being globalized by globalizers. The democratically elected government of President Shisano, which I'm honored to represent, has adopted a five-year program, which started in 95, in which the maintenance of and, and further strengthening of peace stability, unity, and national reconciliation, with emphasis on uh, reduction of absolute poverty, promotion of education, basic health care, and rural development are amongst these priorities. This program merits an endorsement by all parties representing the parliament. My government has succeeded in restoring the education 
and health facilities that had been destroying during the dark years of conflict, which ended in 1992. I must add that over 50 percent of schools and health facilities were destroyed. In addition to the important tasks before us today, our major concern is to provide education to all our people, for we recognize that there can be no progress without education. And learning from Mundan, we regard education as a basic fundamental human right that lays the, the foundations for the materialization of other important human rights, be they political, economical, social, or cultural. The materialization of the right to development as a fundamental human right is intrinsically linked to education. By enrolling in this college, Mundan set an example that all proud Mozambicans are determined to, uh, to honor. Education is therefore the most powerful weapon for the liberation of the peoples, as well as for their economic emancipation. We are thankful to you for helping us open the road to progress. Where would Africa stand today if, so, if some of its most illustrious sons, including Mondani, Kroma, Nyerere, and many other African leaders, had not used education as a weapon to lead their peoples in the struggle against colonialism and oppression? Where would America stand today if leaders like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. had not used education as a weapon to fight against segregation and to promote civil rights, justice, and freedom? Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to conclude by highlighting the great significance we attach to this occasion and wish to pledge to continue this positive relationship initiated by Mondlane. He was indeed a man who contributed to bring together two different cultures and civilizations. Our responsibility today is to strengthen these ties. We have a common goal, which is to keep the ideals of Mondlane alive. I believe it was one of the great leaders of this country who once said that knowledge is like a candlelight. It gives light to another candle without losing its own light. I am quite certain that Oberlin College is doing just that. Mundan always dreamed of education for all his people in order to help them face the challenges of civilization. My dream today is to see more Mozambicans follow the example of Mondane, and I would indeed welcome any such offers that would enable them come to Oberlin College and join you in the near future. In doing so, in so doing, you can contribute to produce more Eduardo Mondanes for Mozambique, Africa, and the world at large. I thank you for kind attention. Thank you so much for that keynote address, uh, bringing us uh, up to date uh, and setting the stage for the presentations to come. We have a special treat this evening. Uh, Professor Herbert Shore, who is a writer, poet, theater director, and oral historian, has come all the way from Southern California to be with us. Uh, he's uh, Professor Emeritus of uh, the School of Theater at the University of Southern California. 
but also well known in Africa, uh, having uh, assisted in the founding and development of theaters uh, in uh, uh, Tanzania, Kenya, Uganda. He's been uh, extremely active in Mozambique. He uh, first became acquainted with Eduardo Monlan in 1962 and was associated with the Mozambique Liber Liberation Movement from that point on. Uh, he, uh, he was not known to me personally until yesterday evening when my wife and I had the pleasure of uh, bringing him and his wife from the airport and uh, I, he is just a delight and uh, uh, it's a special treat to have you here this evening uh, and we await your words. Thank you very much. Are these mics working? Because my voice is very bad. Okay, thank you. Uh, it's gratitude I want to offer to Oberlin College for inviting me to participate in this wonderful celebration. I'm truly honored. And I'm honored to be on the same platform as Minister Simao. Uh, and I, in the presence of Dr. Simao, I would like to point out a small legacy of Eduardo Monlans implied in the very name of his ministry. It's called not simply the Ministry for Foreign Affairs, but Ministry for Foreign Affairs and Cooperation. And it was among the first ever to take a title like this in the world. And doc Dr. Samal tells me that this is the beginning of a trend. And this is something that Eduardo left to us and uh, the seed is planted and the seed will grow. I was asked, invited, and honored in the invitation uh, from Al McQueen to read briefly from some of my own poetry and prose, brief excerpts. I'll try not to make it long in spite of the example he said at the banquet. <laughs> I'll try not to make it long and certainly try not to put you to sleep. But uh, he asked me to do two things. One, to read some excerpts and second, to announce a gift. And uh, it was in that order that he invited me. I'm going to reverse the order. I'm going to tell you about a gift first. And to do it, I've got to put my glasses on because I want to do a two, two or three sentence introduction to that. Before I tell you of this gift, I would like to tell you that uh, in 1986, when I visited Mozambique, I met an amazing and wonderful person named Amaral Matos. Now, Amaral Matos was a member of the underground during the armed struggle against the Portuguese. And in 86, he was a leading member of Frelimo, and I met him at the Center for African Studies at Eduardo Mondlan University. And what he said to me, and this is the prelude to my announcement of a gift, you know, he said, you have to be careful about intellectuals, and you are one. Sometimes, they remind me of the old white hunters in the past. When the white hunters killed a buffalo, they stood on top of the animal to have their photograph taken. But their guides are nowhere to be seen. When a buffalo kills a man, he does not stand on top of the hunter. Intellectuals have a sense of the future. They know how to appear later. We others didn't even know we were making history. And with that introduction, I would simply like to say that we thought it very fitting, my wife and I, to offer the accumulation of a library derived from 50 years of professional work in various fields and an archival collection of that same work uh, in various fields over a 50-year period to Oberlin College as a gift. My second little gift is in response to Al's wonderful invitation to read a bit from my own writing. And I'll make it as brief as I can. Uh, I've excerpted a few things, both prose and poetry, very short, 
and made a cycle out of it, which starts with the tragedy of Eduardo's death, as I experienced it, and ends maybe on a note of hope for the future. And I'd like to introduce that with reading two sentences by way of introduction. Let me find this. And I purposely brought it from here because these are two, two or three sentences from an article that Ed Hawley and Prexy Nesbitt very kindly invited me to write one day for uh, a special issue of Africa Today. And it was called, the essay was called Remembering Eduardo. And it begins this way. On a sunlit Dar es Salaam morning in February 1969, in a small cottage facing the Indian Ocean, Eduardo Chivambo Mandlan was murdered. His life torn away by the explosion of a plastic bomb planted in a book that he opened with the morning mail. On that fateful day, the front for the liberation of Mozambique for Limo lost its leader. Africa lost a great statesman and revolutionary, and I lost a friend and brother a man closer to me than any other I had known in my lifetime. Louder than the heaving earth, the flash of thunder, he sat, my brother, tall and lifeless, like ebony worked by some Mokondi's hands. But life had fled the body, stiff, left the body stiff and wounded without the flow of movement that had changed, charged his flesh before. Like dead wood, log with sightless staring eyes, you were once my laughing, life-living brother. And then when I left East Africa to, to return to the United States, I should say, I didn't say before, this, I said this was a second little gift. This cycle of readings is my gift to my extended family, to Janet, Eddie, Chudan and Nialeti, the Monglan family. Before I left East Africa to return to the United States, after Eduardo's assassination, I visited his still almost unmarked grave in Dar es Salaam, and it was still simply a mound of earth, and I took a pledge. This handful of earth, torn from your grave, sifts through my fingers like a dark chain of memory a rosary of almost joyous pain. It binds me blood to blood, my brother, makes me alien in my own land sometimes. No monkey squats upon my drum, beating strange rhythms and strange sounds. My own hands tap softly, speaking, telling a tale or two softly. I walk the silent river, place my head to the earth, and listen deep for voices, drum sounds. Monomotapa drum sound. Gungunyana, it speaks. Maguiguana, it rumbles. Mondlan. I close my hand over the dry and the empty soil, close my eyes, and hear the sounds of children being born. In my most recent, which was too long ago, trip back to Mozambique, I met a woman in Gaza. Now Gaza is a, was a dry place and when I was there it was undergoing a terrible drought. And she was working the soil when I met her and I asked her why and what was she doing and why was she living in Gaza. And she told me she came from another place, from a distant place where it was green but she loves this land and she was working against the drought so that things would grow again. And that made me think of Eduardo's mother, who he had told me again and again was one of the most influential persons in his life. I had never met her, but this woman made me think of her because she too came from another part of the world, of the African world, the Mozambican world, to, to marry Eduardo's father and settle in the province of Gaza. I listen Gaza, she stands, not blind, but blinded by the wind-blown dust, blood red. Her face is seamed and furrowed like the fields, and there is darkness in her eye. Her skin is cracked, her figure gaunt and dry, sinewy dry like the wind-burned earth. In a distant time, she came to break these fields, and here she walks the line of sky, 
straining with jembe and with plow, the furrows breaking wrinkled, the smell of earth within her nostrils deep, and sweat upon her brow. Once beyond the mangoes, where long ago the waters ran, her heart was shaken, a young girl's heart, waked and fluttered by a kiss within a dream. Her breasts were heavy then, and hung like orchard fruits, awaiting harvest hand. Now, silent in the wind she stands, wind sculptured, motionless and still, deep-rooted in the dry and dying land. This dust, this weightless heavy dust, burdens the quiet air. It sifts its way through doors and windows. Even sleep has dust upon its dreams. The evening shadows bring no dew, no damp, to settle little dust-blown clouds that rise where insects creep or devil puffs of wind stir up the land. Her steps are slow and labored on, on the powdered ground. Its taste is on her tongue. She fears the wind. Her hopes are clouded by a cloudless sky. She waits, and she has waited now too long for rain to turn this dust to earth again. Her eyes look back. Their darkness lingers on. The blighted, crumbling shack in which they live, how stubbornly they keep this place, this land, where roots of thorn trees fumble with the earth, this gray and red, unending land, this yellow sand. Her wasted body struggles now for breath. Within her something lifts and floats away, a vision long submerged within her heart, but now forgotten, now emerges from the mists of long ago. It rises dust-filled through the heavy clouds to set the rhythm of her heart. A girl again, she walks across the lowland fields, made green by rain, in cool forgetfulness of wind-parched slopes. Her steps are slow and heavy on this powdered earth, but what the heart loves most lives longest in the mind. Within her, something lived that would not be forgot. And I'd like to close with another brief piece, if I can find that paper. There it is. On my last trip, last being, I hope, not the last, but the most recent trip long ago, to uh, Mozambique, I met a wonderful young historian named Yusuf Adam. And he said to me once, if you're searching for the meaning of Mondlan, go out where the people carried on the armed struggle, where they are suffering today. Go up to Cabal de Gado. In fact, I will take you there, to a village where they keep a clearing in the bush. It is Mondlan's place. They will tell you and you will know. I will take you there. The clearing in the bush had all the feeling of a sacred place. The old man bent over his stick, had made himself caretaker of it, and women came regularly to sweep it clean by hand with bundles of thin branches. The sunshine filtered through the branches and leaves, and there was a stillness to the place. It is a good place to talk to the ancestors, and he is an ancestor now, the old man said. There was no marker or monument, but everyone knew that this was Mondlan's place. And they will tell you that. During the armed struggle against the Portuguese, he came and spoke with the people there. Ever since then, this clearing had been special. It was here that Mondlan spoke and listened to the people as they talked to him. There was an atmosphere of the sacred about it, and people lowered their voices when they entered the clearing. You could come and sit here for a long time in silence and commune with those who had gone before. He still speaks with us, and we can speak to him, the old man told me. Here you can hear the echo of his voice, and I thought that I could. I sat a long time on a small mound of earth and listened. It was so far different from the tomb of heroes in Maputo, where he is buried, where marble has a hollow sound and heels can puncture silence. And where Janet Mondlan told me as I visited the tomb with her and the Aleti, Eduardo isn't buried here, you know. Oh, I know his bones are in that tomb, but he isn't here. He's out there somewhere and inside of us. Thank you. <laughs>